Permutations and combinations. We're going to start off with a few intuition pumps for permutations. How many ways or unique orderings can three people stand in line? So first of all, when we try to find unique orderings of a group of items, we're talking about permutations, right? So if I have something like this, like A, B, and C, and then I have a permutation of that could be something like A, C, and B, or B, C, and A. So that's what a permutation is. Any of these are permutations of the same thing. The following A, A, B, C, C, B, whatever, these things would not be a permutation of A, B, C because I have two A's. So let's answer this first question. How many ways can three people stand in line? Well, let's give them names just like we did before. Let's say A, B, and C. That's the people. That's their names. And we could simply list all of these out to find how many permutations there are. So A, B, C, A, C, B. Uh, let's start another one over here where they start with B. I think that's all the ones that start with A. Now we're going to do B, C, A. B, A, C, all right, and then we could do C, A, B, and B, C, A. That gives us one, two, three, four, five, six. So our answer is six, and that's one way of doing that. That'll 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 work, right? Um, okay, on to the next one. How many ways can seven people stand in line? All right, so do you really want to write out A, B, C, D, you know, seven letters, and then find all seven unique permutations of those letters? And uh, before we solve this one, just take a guess right now. How many permutations do you think there are of seven things? How many permutations do you think there are of 12 things? All right, do you want to sit there and solve all of those the same way we solved the last one? Well... In a minute, you're going to see why you definitely do not want to do that. We're going to want to come up with a better way. So instead of listing them all off, we want to think back to our three principles of combinatorics. We had multiplication, addition, and then the principle of inclusion-exclusion, sometimes written like P-I-E. And with these three principles, we could solve essentially any problem in all of enumerative combinatorics. Kind of cool, right? So for this one, what we're going to do is we're going to use the multiplication principle. And we're going to say there are seven ways to choose the first person to stand in line. And we're going to multiply that by six, because once we've chosen one person to stand in line, there are six left for us to choose from. After we've chosen the first, the second person, there are five left to be the third person, because we've already chosen the first two people. So there's seven minus two, which gives us five. And we simply can go all the way down like this, using that same logic for each one, until we're left to the last person. And then if we want to solve this, instead of writing each permutation out manually and then counting them, which is very error prone, we could just solve this. So 2 times 1 is 2, 3 times 2 is 6, 4 times 6 is 24. 5 times 24 is 120. 120 times 6 is 720. 7 times 720. 5040. And this is our answer here. So this is a much faster way of doing it. This would take me all day to sit there and count up all the different permutations, and I'd probably make a mistake somewhere along the way. I'd accidentally add one that doesn't belong there or forget to put one in. So this is much better to do this. Now when we have something like this, this 7 times 6 all the way down to 1, this is called a factorial. A factorial is when you start with some number, in our case 7, but we could just call it n, and you say n multiplied by n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 1. We call this a factorial. 
And the way that we notate this mathematically is by using an exclamation mark. So if I have n exclamation mark, we read that as n factorial, where n could be any integer, any positive integer. All right, so here is, again, we're just kind of saying that n exclamation mark or n factorial is the number of ways that you could arrange a list of distinct elements. And here again is the definition of a factorial. Now we're going to get into the permutations formula. So for this question, we have 10 people are competing in a shuffleboard competition. How many ways can gold, silver, and bronze be won? So unlike last time, we're not taking all people, all 10 people, and arranging them. We're actually only selecting three of them. So we have gold, silver, and bronze medals. So how many ways can gold, silver, and bronze medals be won? So what that means is we just, for each medal, we'll just find how many people can possibly win it, and then we will multiply those numbers together. So for gold, how many ways are there to win a gold medal? Well, there's 10 people to choose, so we have 10 possible people that could win the gold. Times for silver, how many people can win? How many how many ways could silver be won? How many different people could win silver? Nine. How about bronze? Well, there we have eight. And that's it. We stop right there. So the answer to this question is 10 times 9 times 8. So that's 90 times 8. What's 90 times 8? We're going to do 8 times 10 is 80, minus 8 is 72. So we have 720 for this one. Simple enough. All right, and now we have this weird looking equation, 7p4. We read that as 7 permutation 4. So this is the mathematical way of writing if we have seven people to choose from, and we choose four of them, how many ways can we arrange those people? So if I were to do, if I were to have a group of seven people, and I wanted to see how many unique lines of four people can I make? So just like last time, we would do seven times six times five times four. And that would be our answer. We would just multiply this out. You could go ahead and do that on your own. That would be our answer. Another thing we could do is, to get the same answer, but another way of looking at it is you could write 7 factorial divided by 7 minus 4 factorial. And so remember, I'm just going to write over here the answer we got from the last question. It was 7 times 6, times 5, times 4. We start at 7, and we went down by 1 4 times. So 1, 2, 3, 4. That's how we got that. So let's see what happens if we expand this out. So what is 7 factorial? 7 factorial is the same as saying 7 times 6, times 5, and we just do that all the way down to 1, times 4, times 3, times 2, times 1. All of that over 7 minus 4 factorial. That's 3 factorial, so we could do 3 times 2 times 1. And we really could have left those 1s off, right? Anything times 1 is just itself. So let's go ahead and cancel out like terms. We start with the 1, the 2, and the 3. And look at what we're left with here in the numerator. We're left with 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 over 1, because all of these canceled out as well. So writing it out this way gives us the exact same thing as the other way, as just going 7 times 6 times 5 times 4. It gives us the same answer. And here again, I just have it summarized. When you have n permutation r, that equals n factorial over n minus r factorial, which can also be written out this way. You start at n, and you go n minus 1 
so n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, all the way down r amount of times, that's what this is going to be. That's This is going to be the same as this. And so this next topic is really, really important in combinatorics. We're going to learn about combinations. So the first question is, how many ways can I form an a cappella trio if 10 people auditioned, but the order in which they are picked does not matter? So the first thing we're going to do here is close up my parentheses that I forgot to close when I made this question. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to solve this problem. So I'm going to write it out kind of with some mathematical fancy schmancy notation. So here we have 10 people auditioning, and we're trying to make a trio. So since we have 10 people and we're trying to make a trio, we write it this way. 10 choose 3. This is how we would say this, is 10 choose 3. With the 10 over the 3 in parentheses like this, not to be confused with 10 divided by 3. This is a totally different concept than 10 divided by 3. And so the way we solve this is we start off solving it just like we would with permutations. So if we had 10 permutation 3, we would do 10 times 9 times 8. And we would stop there. We would just say, well, that's, that's, that's how many different permutations of size 3 that we could choose from 10. So if order matters, we just stop here with what I have in red. But... We don't want to stop there because we don't want to know how many permutations there are. We want to know how many combinations there are. And if there's combinations, this would be an overcount. 10 times 9 times 8 is an overcount because that shows us how many permutations there are. And the order matters in permutations. The order does not matter in combinations. So what this means is we're counting a lot of the same combinations that just have different orders. So if we want to get rid of those different orders, on the bottom here, on the denominator, we're going to put... 3 factorial, because there are 1, 2, 3 people being chosen each time in the numerator. So we're going to do 3 factorial, which is 3 times 2. I don't have to write the 1, because anything times 1 is just one, is just itself. So let's go ahead and solve this one. We have, um, let's see, we could cancel out with the 2 and the 10 here. That could become a 5. And we could cancel out with the 3 and the 9, so that this can become a 3. So now we have 8 times 3 times 5. Let's do this. So let's do 5 times 3. That equals 15. And then 15 times 8 is going to be 120. So 120 is our final answer for this one. We could make 120 unique trios from 10 people. Let's go on to our next one. How many ways can I form an a cappella septet if 10 people auditioned? So a septet means a group of seven people. And again, the order does not matter. So it doesn't matter how we pick them. It just matters who at the end gets picked. OK, so for this one, we're going to solve 10 choose 7. And we're going to use the same technique that we used last time. So last time, I'll just write the answer out over here. We got 120 last time. OK, so this time we're going to do 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6, all the way down 7 times. So we're going to do 10 times 9 times 8 times 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So we started at 10, and we went down 7 times, because we're trying to choose a septet this time. And we're going to put all that over the factorial of 7. So that's going to be 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. And you could leave out the 1 because anything times 1 is itself. OK, so let's start canceling like terms. Well, they both have a 7, so we'll get rid of the 7. 
They both have a 6. We'll get rid of the 6. Both have a 5. Get rid of that. And they both have a 4. We'll get rid of that. They don't both have a 3. But we have a 3 down here. And we have a 9 up here. So that means this 9 can become a 3. And we don't have a 2 in the numerator. But we do have a 10 and an 8. Which both divide by 2. So let's say 5. Does this look familiar yet? Our answer is 5 times 3 times 8. Which is 120. Hmm. So what happened there? Is it just a coincidence that we get the same answer when we do 10 choose 3 and 10 choose 7? Well, it's actually not a coincidence. With combinations, there's a little bit of symmetry. I'll start with a simple case that's quite obvious. If we have 10 people and we're choosing 0, how many ways can we do that? Well, we just but There's one way we could do it, right? We just don't pick anybody. That's the only way. How about if I have 10 people and I want to choose all 10 of them? How many ways can I do that? Just one way, right? There's one way to do this. You just pick everybody. Okay, so what if I have 10 people and I want to pick one of these 10 people? How many ways can I do that? Well, there's 10 people and we're going to pick one of them. Clearly, there's 10 ways to do it. If there's 10 people and I want to pick 9 of them, how many ways are there to do that? Slightly less obvious, but the answer there is still 10. The reason is, instead of thinking of it as picking 9 out of 10, just think of it as excluding 1 out of 10. So there's the same number of ways to pick somebody as there are to exclude that many people. Let's do one more. 10 choose 2 is the same as 10 choose 8. Instead of picking 8 people, we think of excluding 2 people. And that'll work for any numbers we choose. So we could generalize this a bit to be for any two numbers, n and r, n being the number on top, r being the number on bottom, we could say n choose r equals n choose n minus r. That's going to be the same. That's a property of combinations that will help us and will really be useful later on when we get into more advanced topics. And here's the combination formula, also known as the binomial coefficient. Notice that it looks almost identical to the permutations formula, except we have this r factorial at the end. So the permutations formula was n factorial over n minus r factorial. And this is the only difference between the combinations formula, or the binomial coefficient, and the permutations formula. This is also what gives it its symmetry. Remember how I said this? I said n over r equals n over n minus r. Well, now we could see why that is, because we have both n minus r factorial and r factorial in the denominator. So we multiply those two together. That's why we get this symmetry here. And our last one I want to go over is permutations with repeats. So sometimes we want to find how many permutations we could get of, like in this case, a word, Illinois. But there's something that repeats in there, right? So we can't just say Illinois has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 letters. We can't just say it has 8 letters. So if I want to find all the permutations of Illinois, I just do 8 factorial. Boom, it's done. Nope, I can't do that, right? I can't do that because there are these L's that repeat. So we have two L's, and we have three I's. So if I just did 8 factorial, I'd be counting a lot of different permutations that are actually the same. So for instance, if I swapped, say, this first I with this last I, same word. If I swapped this first L with this last L, same word. And there's other combinations of ways I could swap these I's, too. So what we want to do is, for each unique permutation of Illinois, or each, let's say, each permutation that, that may or may not be unique, um, if we just did it the old-fashioned way, right, we just did 8 factorial, 
we'd be coming up with several different repeats here, several for the L's and several more for the I's. So how do we correct this? Well, just like with combinations, we correct the overcounting with division. So we could do eight factorial as our numerator instead of the entire answer, we just use it as a numerator. And then for each of these groups of letters that repeat, so here's one group is the I's, and here's another group for the L's. Those are two groups that have more than one of the same element. We just divide by the factorial of the size of that group. So we have one group of three and one group of two. So we have eight factorial divided by three factorial times two factorial. And much like the binomial coefficient, we can write it out this way. That's not 8 over 32, that's 8 over 3 and 2. 3 and 2 are separate numbers there. This is called the multinomial coefficient. We have our equation up here, our notation for it, and this equals n, which is the number of things we have, regardless of whether they're unique or not. And then we divide that by the factorial of each group. So each group that's more than one. You could do each group even if it's not more than one, but there's no point in multiplying something by one factorial because that's just one. So for each group that's larger than one, we usually say, and we multiply the denominator by the factorial of that. And that gives us our multinomial coefficient, closely related to the binomial coefficient. That's why it has this similar notation here.